Hello YouTubers, it is of course me, Trollface the Man, and today I'm going to be doing a video on how to grow stunning bismuth crystals from Elemental Bismuth. This is a brilliant looking, high density, low toxicity, and easy to melt metal. Most of its properties are not too dissimilar to lead, at least density wise and melting temperature wise. Bismuth is slightly less dense though. However, it is extremely different in the fact that bismuth is relatively non-toxic. Because of this, bismuth and its alloys have been used for casting non-toxic bullets, shot, and fishing sinkers for a while now. Though what is probably more applicable to the general populace watching, bismuth is likely lurking in either your medicine cabinet or fridge right now as a stomach aid and anti-diarrheal. Yes, I am talking about the pink stuff known as Pepto-Bismol, also sometimes known as Pepto-Bismuth because of its active ingredient bismuth subsalicylate. Chemical formula C7H5Bi1O4, which is also a type of aspirin, interestingly enough. Yes, it contains the same bismuth metal as we are going to use to grow crystals here today. Pepto bismol isn't the only GI aid that uses bismuth salts. There are probably dozens of other products, generic or not, that use it too. But the point is, for a heavy metal, it is fairly safe to handle and even consume. Now I know some people out there might go, <laughs> I got you there, because if you look at the material safety data sheet for bismuth, it tells you to wash your hands after handling it, so it obviously must not be safe. <laughs> Stupid. Whoa, let me stop you right there, buddy. Yes, it does, but MSDSs are oftentimes way overdramatic. For example, it tells you to do that too if you come in contact with copper or nickel. As a matter of fact, it tells you to wash all of your clothes that have been contaminated by contact with copper or nickel and to seek medical attention. Pretty inconvenient if true. I suppose that means we'd have to strip down to our skippies and rush to the hospital every time we handled a copper American penny or handled the aptly named American nickel. Other currencies are available. My point is, even looking at the biological hazard rating of the MSD sheets, Bismuth is rated as less hazardous than either copper or nickel. Some sheets I looked at actually rated it as not being hazardous at all. So if you're not afraid of handling some change, then you shouldn't really fear bismuth then. Though honestly the change is pretty scary when you consider where it may have been. Not so much the metals it's made from though. The biggest actual concern of potential bismuth poisoning would be fumes, which I will talk about here shortly, but let's move on to what will actually be needed. First, we are going to need a stainless steel pot of some kind. I got this from a thrift shop. Even though the bismuth is relatively non-toxic or low toxicity, I'd recommend not using it in something you plan to cook with again. It's just a good idea to keep metals or chemicals used in experiments separate from food. The container should have a few inches depth, and bonus points for a smaller opening on the container too, as having a bigger opening means more surface area on the hot metal, which in turn means more oxidizing and slag on the metal, which will waste it. You'll still need a few inches to work with though, so I recommend maybe four through five inch mouth to keep surface area down, but also give a reasonable area to grow and maneuver with. The depth is important because our crystals will be growing downward, and without proper room below the metal surface to do so, they won't turn out very well. For making a batch of these crystals, I recommend using at least 5 pounds of metal. You can do it with maybe half of that weight, but it makes things more difficult. Plus, the more you buy at once, the more you save. For example, if you bought only 2.5 pounds instead of 5, you'll likely pay about 50% more per pound. If you only buy one, you'll possibly pay 100% more per pound. So bulk is typically better. Another thing we'll need is some heat resistant gloves that should be worn whenever around the molten metal. Though you'll see me not doing so because I like to live on the edge. And I have lots of experience dealing with molten metals which in general keeps me safe. One thing I do not skip on though is wearing safety glasses of some kind as an unfortunate splash or splatter could easily blind you. Also with this in mind, never add anything wet into molten bismuth including wet metal, tools, or any liquids directly as it will likely cause a steam pop or explosion which will shoot molten metal everywhere. Other than that, we need my secret ingredient for growing bigger and better crystals. Sand. Yes, ordinary sand, you heard me right. But make sure it is dry, this is important as we will be heating it later and wet sand may pop or splatter while heating, which we don't want. 
We'll also need one more container that is larger than our melting dish like so. The melting dish I use already has bismuth in it from a previous batch and contains roughly 3 pounds of bismuth. So to start we'll fill the outside container with sand, which is important because the sand is going to add extra thermal mass and insulation from cooling. This is important because in general the crystals will grow bigger when they have slower cooling cycles. The problem is when most people make these crystals they do so in just a regular dish heated directly on a stove. The problem with that is it cools really quickly, making proper big crystals hard to form. By using the sand, the bismuth metal overall cools slower and in theory makes bigger crystals. Using something like the sand to slow the cooling is even more important when using small amounts of metal like so, as the metal doesn't have much thermal mass by itself and will cool rather quickly. Now we just heat the sand dish and wait for the bismuth to melt, which will take longer than typical due to also having to heat the sand. This is good though, as with a container like this with metal already present in it, rapid heating could lead to some bad things as the metal expands somewhat and could spurt out violently if heated too quickly. You can see some coming to the surface as the heated metal expands in this shot. Eventually after a time the metal will melt and we'll be left with something like this. If I take a spoon and skim the surface, we can see the nice shiny molten bismuth underneath, at least for a short while as it rapidly oxidizes once again. Now with this, a couple of things need to be said. First off, many people believe this nasty layer you see on top is impurities in the metal coming to the surface. No, not unless you have really low quality metal it isn't. It's a chemical reaction the hot bismuth is undergoing when reacting to the air. It's bismuth oxide, and it's not something you want to be forming as it will slowly turn your metal into a useless slag like so. The issue is, the more you skim the surface, the more oxide will form as new metal is exposed and thereby the more metal you will lose. I suggest skimming the surface only once during the initial melting, and not again until the next melting or if you get really bad buildup. Interestingly enough, this oxide in a very thin film is what gives the crystals their amazing color. I do plan to do a future video where I convert this slag back into a usable metal. Remember to subscribe or stay subscribed if you want to see that. Also as a heads up, the bismuth metal will pull easily off this spoon when cold. Normally we would use fluxes or an oxygen free environment to prevent slag formation when melting metals. But in this case, the best way to prevent it is using a smaller mouth container and thereby have less metal exposure to the air, and keeping the temperature low as the higher it gets the quicker the oxide will form. Another reason to keep the temperature low is because heating metals to melting can actually release metal fumes which can be dangerous. HOWEVER, there is huge misconceptions about this out there, especially when it comes to toxic metals like lead, where people think instantly any time a metal is melted, it fills the room with TOXIC METAL VAPORS. No it doesn't. Just like water, metals have a boiling point. The closer you get to said boiling point, the quicker they will vaporize or evaporate. So with metals, the higher you heat them, the more fumes they will produce. At a point where metals are just melted, 520.5 degrees Fahrenheit or 271.4 degrees Celsius, in the case of bismuth they will produce basically no fumes at all at atmospheric pressure. Now if you heat the metal to its boiling point or close to it, being 2847 degrees Fahrenheit or 1564 degrees Celsius, in the case of bismuth then yes, there will be a lot of fumes generated. Point is though, even at several hundred degrees over its melting temperature, bismuth, like most metals, will produce negligible metal fumes. However, I always like to side with caution, so I will say it's not a bad idea to do this in a place with good ventilation, even though your gas stove, if you have one, is a better reasoning than bismuth fumes to do so. Speaking of which, as soon as it seems that the metal has fully melted, cut the heat. And now we play a waiting game where we occasionally touch the surface with our removal tool, in my case tweezers, and see if we feel anything. Eventually you'll see squarish crystals floating on the surface. It's up to you how long you want to wait before picking them out, but in general, the longer you wait, the bigger they get. Wait too long and they may fuse to other crystals or the bottom of the container. So you have to be careful. Remember, in general, the deeper the container you have and the more metal you have, the bigger you can grow the crystals. Here you see me plucking out a few. 
Admittedly, I should have used the tweezers to grab either side of the crystals instead of the edges, but I didn't think of it at the time. Within seconds of plucking them out, you will see the crystals form a brilliant iridescent rainbow color. Any that you don't like, you just throw back in and remelt. Cool, and then grab some more. General tip is that usually the first crystals that form are the largest, and later crystals that form are typically smaller and more abundant. This has to do with the crystals having more general nuclei points to grow as the metal cools. The last batch I go a little crazy and just scoop out some with a spoon. Now I don't recommend poking recently molten metal with your bare fingers like I do here. For fun, I will just pour out the still molten bismuth into another container and show what is left behind. In doing so, I found a crystal left behind that I like and I work to remove and preserve it from the container, which I eventually do. Bismuth has a very crumbly texture and for the most part can be broken apart by hand in thin areas, but is decently strong in its crystal form. Here is a few of the ones I like and decided to keep from this batch. Most are fairly large and well defined, and easily could go much larger if I had a ridiculous amount of money to spend on more bismuth metal for larger batches, which I do not. I have even more amazing ones I got from some test batches I did such as these. So that is pretty much it in terms of making your own large and high quality bismuth crystals. Remember, slower cooling is good and that you'll want to play it safe whenever dealing with molten metals. Thank you guys for watching and if you like this video, please consider supporting me by dropping a like, comment, and subscribing. Also, thank you to my Patreons for the support and buying materials used for this video, which cost over $100 when including test batches. It is very much appreciated. And if you're not already, I hope you might consider supporting too. One last thing, I am starting to sell t-shirts, which you can pick up using the link below. Thank you all for watching, and bye!